Welcome to Second Tuesday Lunch and Learn. I'm Leslie Canarium, Reader Conversations Librarian here at the Rogers Public Library. Special shout out to the friends of the library who sponsor these programs. I would like to welcome the Garden Club of Rogers. Hello. And welcome to the Rogers Public Library. I see a lot of familiar faces out here, and I am so glad that you are all able to join us today. As you came in, there's a table in the front that has some membership information about the Rogers or the Garden Club of Rogers and also about the food bank, which has provided us with some seeds that we'll be passing out. So there's a variety of free seeds here as well as seeds from the Garden Club of Rogers. These are native plant seeds from the Butterfly Park at the rail yard with some information attached to them about how to prepare a pollinator porch garden right there in your own backyards. So these will be in the front by Diana's membership um, table in the front. We hope that you got some tea and we will be passing out different types of edibles that you're going to hear about in the presentation. Um, as soon as Haley gets going, I'd like to introduce the people who are going to be talking. I am Liz Pierce-Smith, the Civic Community uh, Garden Chair for Garden Club of Rogers. Diana Blass is over here, our membership chair. And Haley O'Brien, who is the Horticulture Chair and also a cook extraordinaire. So I think you're going to have a fun time. And again, I'm so glad that you're here joining us. The history and purpose of GCR, it was established in November 1929, and in just six years, we will celebrate its 100th year, so we're proud of that. In 1929, Ms. Vera Key founded the Garden Club of Rogers with 10 women who met in her home, and they had a love of gardening and a common goal to make Rogers the most beautiful city in Arkansas, which is our continued goal. As of November 2023, we now have 104 members. In addition to our founder's vision of beautifying Rogers, GCR pro promotes the use of native Arkansas plants and flowers that provide nectar, pollen, and habitat for pollinators such as bees, butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds, especially at our famous butterfly park. It's even on the bus route. <laughs> In 1931, <clears throat> GCR had its first flower show and most beautiful yard contest, and it provided funds, planting and upkeep for Campus Park, and it created a mile-long nature trail identifying and tagging plants. Currently, GCR honors Rogers residents with Garden of the Month for outstanding yards that our, um, one of our committee chairmen drives around Rogers looking for, beautiful gardens. And the butter, oh, most well known is the Butterfly Park at First and Cherry where the uh, Frisco Caboose now sits. So you can find our garden when you're downtown. Uh, things are going dormant now, but look to go down there um, in spring, summer, and fall. It's a teaching garden planted predominantly with native Arkansas pollinator flowers, and it has educational signage about our native butterflies and the plants that they like for their nectar. The labor involved is a collaboration between GCR and the Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalists. They do some of the heavy labor, but our volunteers work hard. Please visit the park when you're in downtown Rogers. In 1947, Ms. Vera and members held a fundraiser in order to plant 2,000 dogwood, redwood, and maple trees, redwood, uh, which they set all over town, including along Poplar, South 4th Streets, West Pine, and at Rogers Cemetery on 10th and Oaks. That's something I want to go and walk around and look for old trees, especially in spring. I love those dogwood and redbud blooms. They don't last very long, though. GCR was instrumental in getting Rogers designated as a Tree City USA in 1986 and has continued the practice of planting trees throughout Rogers through our Arbor Day Committee, including at the Butterfly Park, Lake Atlanta, and behind the Heritage High baseball field. Some trees have honored or are in memory of outstanding members who have served GCR extraordinarily and who have made us proud. There's one here today who was so honored. Ms. Vera was also instrumental in the, in the establishment of the Rogers Historical Museum, another place to go downtown. 
and <clears throat> that was in the 1980s, and she remained a strong supporter of Rogers for many years, which we all can be strong supporters of our city, um, until she died in 1987 at age 94. She willed her house to the Museum Commission, and that endowment fund continues to support museum operations today. The museum is also our host during National Garden Week in June when we sponsor a children's gardening activity at Family Day. In the years since GCR was established, many devoted members have volunteered to serve on club committees and our outreach programs, such as pre-K students who learn through hands-on projects relating to butterfly and caterpillars. They go crazy over the monarch, the chrysalises. I did this year too, I never had any and um, planting chia people, seeds, and annuals. GCR hosts an annual May plant sale, and you've got to come to that. It'll be advertised, and if you want to sign up to come to that in May, just put your name over by, I'm interested in attending a meeting, or I'm interested in coming to the uh, plant sale. Just put your name and email, we'll let you know about it. And as well, garden therapy is facilitated at a Rogers Senior Living and Memory Care facility for the residents to make floral designs and enjoy each other's company and do other fun flowery activities. Um, at GCR meetings, members bring their pennies for the Penny Pines Project, and that helps reforest areas that have been burned over. Members can nominate any one of us who has helped in GCR projects and one nominee is honored with a tree planted in their name at the Wachita Forest of Arkansas. In 2022, GCR was honored by the Arkansas Recreation and Parks Association for its dedication and the many volunteer hours its members donated. Okay, if we back up just a little bit here, you're going to see some of the different things that the Rogers Garden Club has participated in that Diana talked about. Information about pollinators and butterflies. Um, the garden therapy over here where we're working with seniors in, um, in Rogers and showing them once again how, how fun it is to get their hands back in the dirt and uh, grow and learn at the same time. Um, you see different volunteers here during seed harvest, our collaboration with Master Naturalists over here, and then outreaches with floral decorations. One of the things I want to back up before I turn this over to Ms. Haley, at the beginning here, Tasty Tales from the Garden. The reason that we titled this presentation as Tasty Tales from the Garden is because Roger, the Garden Club of Rogers has luncheons, and you all have parties and luncheons and dinner gatherings at your home where food is served and conversation flows. So the rest of this presentation is going to be to show you how you can enhance any tea time conversation or luncheon with legends, recipes, and garden designs. So when you bring your friends over to your home and you're sharing Thanksgiving and all these different ways of gathering together, we want you to know that things from your garden can be on that table and the stories they tell can be some of the stories that you share with family and friends. So we're going to have Miss Haley O'Brien come up next who is our cook extraordinaire, and she's going to introduce you to some of these interesting flavors and wonderful plants. Well, hello, everyone. Did everybody get a chance to give a taste to the lemongrass tea? So what we did over here, and this is not a native plant, but I know all of us like to grow different edible herbs, and that is actually some fresh lemongrass at the, from the end of the season out of my garden. And dehydrated and frozen, you can both hold on to some of the essential oil character beautifully. There's a touch of black tea in there and then a little bit of honey as well. And then on top, you'll see there's a little bit of dried marigold and pansy. So the other fun way to really get some, you know, pizzazz, I would say, out of your garden is kind of taking some of those flowers and dehydrating them and, you know, making sure they're sealed nice. You can garnish salads that way or really any dish that you're putting out. When we're dealing with some of these native plants, not the cultivars or the herbs that we, you know, are used to growing, but the different native plants that are actually filled with tons of nutritional and medicinal value. I mean, these edible plants grow like weeds all around us throughout the, the entire country. And they really have sustained native tribes and really they give us the chance to 
not only take care or really take the best use of our resources, but we're also able to carry forward tradition and knowledge that has been built over centuries. Um, so whenever you're foraging, there are a couple things I really want you to be aware of. First of all, you can purchase completely native plants from different plant sales. I recommend coming to our plant sale because we do have a very strong collection of native plants. But you want to make sure that you are either uh, foraging off, of, you know, from your own yard or somebody's personal property. You're not supposed to uh, be out foraging in public grounds or protected parks unless you have a license to do so. There are several groups of people who host great forage walks throughout the Ozarks that are licensed to host those and have worked with the parks, which are great resources for further education. But whenever you're um, foraging, you really also want to make sure you don't forage the whole plant. Let's think about this. The plant is not just feeding you, it's feeding some of the uh, birds or the bees or the bugs around you. Um, and so you want to make sure you leave some behind. So not only the uh, animals or the bugs have something to eat, but also the plant's able to reproduce itself. So you really want to be mindful of how much you take. Then. Additionally, whenever you're introducing new plants to your diet, you want to make sure that you don't eat an excess quantity at first because some of these plants, you know, have strong medicinal properties, have different bitterness levels, and may, your body may not be used to some of the actual nutritional value to it, or it may cause some digestive unrest or upset. Um, now, the one thing I will also say is researching the plants that you're planning on using will help you be more confident because, you know, some of them are best used in smaller quantities. When, you, when it comes to wood sorrel, if you have any kind of kidney issue, it's really recommended not to eat that in excess or at all. So knowing these little things about each different plant and that extra research can go a long way. This way you can also find out if certain plants need cooking or extra processing, like removing seeds or stems, because some edible plants, the whole plant is edible, and others, of course, it's not. Um, I mean, that goes for our cultivars as well. But um, really, I also like to think when you're out foraging in nature, there's some, a really special connection. Or if even you planted these in your, on your own property and you're still out there with the earth, even in your own garden, just with your herbs, um, I really think thanking the earth and being present and connecting with the beauty and the magic around you is an important part of the process as well. Um, I did list some resources down here. Wildones.org has an Ozark chapter. It's a national organization that focuses on educating people on wild plants. They are a great resource on their website just to learn or to go to any of their meetups. FirstEarth.org, um, actually the owner of that is Bo Brown up here um, and he, uh, actually wrote this book, Forging the Ozarks, and he is a local, or Springfield Ozarks um, local who hosts a lot of different foraging events throughout the area. And I highly recommend just going online and looking at some of the national foragers, like the Forager Chef or a Black Forager, who's uh, Alexis Nicole Nelson, which are both wonderful spokespeople for easy education. Now, when we actually go into the ones, I just want to talk a little bit about beauty berries. This is a plant that I have purchased and is now in my garden, has been there for one season. And the jelly that you have on your plate that we're about to hand out is actually made from my first harvest from it. So a lot of learning came into it. When you eat them fresh, they're, they didn't have as much flavor as we expected. But as soon as you start cooking them down, a really unique characteristic comes out. I will point out the uh, little gold spoon is in your beauty berry jelly to start. So if you do start trying that with some of your biscuit, that is where you can begin. The cool thing about this is it is a pretty rapid growing shrub. So I've had mine in for one season. It's already up to here and I'm really excited about it. It can be easily pruned as well. Um, it can do well in partial shade or full sun. And then as I said, these are great, the berries for birds, butterflies, bees, incredible little pollinator plant. And when I harvested these, I made sure to leave some behind. Of course, and then I also brought you guys a couple of them on an actual stick so you can get a really good actual image of them. So if we want to hand that around, you can take a look at that. Um, but what's incredible about this is if you look at this slide here, you can see 
Not only has it been used in the Native American culture for malaria, rheumatism, stomach and dysentery, but it's also tuted for its high vitamin C level and fiber and antioxidant compounds. Now, whenever it comes to some of the culinary uses, you can just sprinkle the little berry pieces fresh on top of a salad as a garnish, and it's gorgeous. You can make jelly, of course. I will say it won't produce really a jam where you can leave the fruit in. It's best strained out. Um, it really looks nice if you uh, make like any kind of pancakes, waffles, or a dessert item that you put whipped cream on top. If you sprinkle a few beauty berries on top of the whipped cream, gives it a really fun pop of color. Um, another really neat way that Liz tried it was she dehydrated, dehydrated, de dehydrated them first and kind of toasted them and put them in shortbread. And oh my gosh, the amount of flavor that really came out of that once they've gone through the dehydration process and being roasted was really surprising. Um, you can obviously make a little syrup or even put together like a wine reduction sauce or something like that with a little bit of a very light wine. Um, and then, yeah, again, that dehydrating and toasting them, you could just be sprinkling those on top of anything and have fun with them. What do they look like toasted? They're so pretty color. Mm. I put them on a baking dish and put them in the oven at about 400. And they turn brown. They lose that beautiful, beautiful color. color. So if you want the color, if you want to keep the color as a garnish, sprinkling it on the top of salads, don't dry it. Just leave it fresh off of here. Now, when I was tasting them, I did not, um, I did, the ones that I harvested, I did not really get that tart, lemony burst of flavor. The ones that Haley harvested did. Now, both, both were harvested about the same time. And I actually added a little bit of lemon peel and a little bit of lemon juice kind of almost in some of, in the actual um, jelly. So it was almost kind of like a marmalade, little slice piece of lemon in there too. But here's, I want to add this really quick. I froze some. They retain their color beautifully. They do not lose their color in freezing. And once they're frozen, if you pop them in your mouth, they do have that sharp lemon zang to them. So maybe, so, maybe on you know, ice cream frozen. I will, I will tell you one thing. <laughs> When you thaw them back out, they do lose their color. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> but it comes back out in the jelly. It's real weird. It was very, very You know what I just happened to think of, to, just to add to the frozen idea, is that sometimes when I come a glass of white wine on the back porch in the summertime, I'll put frozen blueberries in my wine. That way, as the blueberries thaw, you're not getting it watered down like you would with an ice cube, and it still keeps your white wine chill. What the service berry, frozen service oh, berry, yeah, berry yeah. yeah, the beauty, not service berry, right, beauty berry in, in your wine, or, a, oh gosh, or a sangria? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and where are a couple other questions real quick? Is there a wild fruit that's beauty berry that grows here that's similar, but the color isn't that good? It's more yes, red. those are the, they're, well, it'll be a purpley and it's Asian. If it grows up the stalk and not in those clusters, then it's the Asian service or beauty berries. It is edible as well, but it lacks the flavor. Something that's the clusters, but it's smaller and not that bright. Don't eat it. If you don't know what it is, don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Until you get What's that saying? What's that saying? Every plant is edible. Once. <laughs> <laughs> so next up here, we have a, a big favorite of mine, and I'm sure many of you folks who enjoy pollinator garden, being bee balm, also known as wild bergamot, monarda, or horseman. And it's derived from the Greek word uh, meaning double. And it's really called that for all of its little paired stamens on the flowers you see. They're just stunning. Now, Menarda does grow pretty aggressively and pretty tall, um, but it can do really well in part shade or in full sun. I have some in a pretty shady spot, and I was really shocked by how well it's doing. Um, obviously, it's a huge pollinator plant, but the cool thing about it is when it comes to these health properties, it's antimicrobial. Anti it can help fight indigestion, bloating, bloating, nausea, supposedly even menstrual cramps, and it can help with 
coughs. So the fact that it could even be a stress reliever and have all these qualities where it benefits bugs and it's easy to grow, um, it's awesome. So you can also, it was used for poultices, for headaches and sore eyes, you can make tinctures. I mean, the list goes on and on. When it comes straight up to the culinary uses, what we did was made a fresh tomato jam, and I'm gonna go ahead and shout out to Beth Carney over here for her tomatoes, they're so fabulous, and featured in this tomato jam on the plate. Um, so we've got, when I say a tomato jam, you blister the tomatoes, you put some onion and garlic, and a very healthy amount of sugar. Um, and uh, what I did for the bee balm is, it's so intense, so much more intense than oregano, that I didn't want to simmer the jam, you know, heavily with it. So I waited till I pulled the jam off the stove, put it in the blender, and blended the Minarda just with the hot jam itself instead of letting it cook for a long time because a little bit goes a long way because it is quite intense. I'm gonna go ahead and hand out a piece and feel free to rip some of this up. I had some growing fresh under the leaves with this nice weather. But feel free to tear some of this, these fresh leaves up. The other things that are wonderful that bee balm can be used for is whenever you're doing like a pesto or a chimichurri or some kind of herb puree, you could add a little bit of this. Or if you wanted to just do a garlic and minarda, like olive oil, really intense herb puree, just to throw a little bit into different recipes, very, very fun. Um, it's also great to add into soups or sauces or stocks. I'm going to have to make a tomato sauce with roasted tomatoes with it. Like that's on my to-do list now. Um, and then also um, you can dehydrate it and then you can turn it into an herb salt that you season with. And that way you're adding that little herbal tinge and that nutritional value right there to anything that you sprinkle it on. Um, and then the other note is both the flowers and leaves are edible. So you can see here there's even some bee balm tea being made with some of the flowers. What was your question? Yeah, well, uh, why do you call it bee balm? Do bees like it? Oh, yeah. they love it. Does bee balm come in other colors or just red? red? It does come in a couple different colors. There's a lighter lavender, there's the red, and then I think I've even seen kind of a pinkish one too. Like so this plant has blown me away as a whole. I'm not going to say it's my favorite of the four I'm talking about because I love them all so much, but the anise hyssop not only is so gorgeous with the amount of flowers it produces, but also so many fun little bugs come visiting. And again, anywhere from two to five foot tall. I've had mine in for uh, now I think this is its actually its first full season as well. I put it at the same time that I put in my beauty berry. And um, the... Uh, amazing amount of licorice kind of characteristic that you get to it is mind-blowing. Um, so the cool thing about this when it comes to kind of the folklore aspects, it symbolized cleanliness and was used to purify holy places. And that's just pretty wild to me. Um, also, it um, has been used for digestive upset, to freshen breath, to relieve depression, to treat burns, which I did not know. Um, and when it is actually considered a really incredible essential oil for herbal medicine. Um, also, we found out that it can be used as fish bait. I don't know if that's sort of the shape of the, of the actual flower, but you know, it is kind of elongated. And uh, you could totally put it in little like lavender dream pillows or eye pillows uh, to help with sweet dreams. Now, when it comes to some of the culinary uses, when I, I want to also hand her out a little anise hyssop. Let's see, yeah, this piece here. And again, feel free to break a little off or just kind of smell a little bit there. The leaves are edible as well, but you only really want to enjoy the leaves in the spring or when they're turning out new. So I actually had a little more growth recently, surprisingly. But in the spring, the tender leaves can be used in salad blends to create really incredible characteristics. Um, again, this is a great one to make tea with. If you combine this with your Minarda and a little lemongrass, you're going to have a really dynamic tea. Um, any type of baked goods, like these little cute whoopie pies. Um, but what I did with them is I, my little sister lives in New Mexico, and we fell in love with what's called the bizcochito, which is a type of, it's supposed to be New Mexico's official cookie. But it's got usually anise seed in it, and it has a little cinnamon, and it's kind of like a little basic butter cookie. It's a little uh, rectangular fella on your plate. 
And instead of the anise seed, which I did have a lot of trouble getting level anise flavor from the anise seed, I'd have to crush it up a bunch and use a lot. I let the um, actual flowers dry out, sun dry on the actual plant to this stage. And when I crushed this up and got a whiff of this, I was like, oh. This right here is going to be what makes our, our next level biscuitito. So instead of using aniseed, that is featured um, crushed up into a kind of fine floury powder. Uh, and it smells like pure licorice when it has sun dried to that brown kind of coloration on the plant. If you harvest it fresher, you may get a little bit of a zippier, more like fennel like anise to it. But um, the other things you can use it for. You could try making an anise liqueur, kind of your own variation of like fernet or something. Um, you could put it into rubs, herbs, herb blends or spice blends, and that would be really incredible like on lamb or beef or even chicken. Um, you could also dehydrate it and turn it into a flavored sugar. So that, that way you have like a uh, base licorice-y like sweet sugar that you can add to different recipes or toss things in. Um, Again, put in a little bit of honey or syrup to create a really unique flavor. And then last, we talked about it briefly. We drank it in the tea, but lemongrass has some really cool roots to the history. This is not a native plant. It is an annual that dies out, but I will say, putting it in the ground, you really don't have to do much with it. In a pot, you do have to water it a lot. I dropped a few in the ground. They got about this tall, right out, and kind of some west-facing, some with part shade during the day. Um, and I will say that the uh, tops of the lemongrass, I like to cut back and dry and hold on to for making tea and stocks, but the base, where the really aromatic part is and the more tender area, that is what I save to make curry paste. Mm -hmm. And it is fabulous. But what's really cool is it's believed to bring good luck in love affairs, but that part's not cool. But it's the, the protection against the evil spirits in a, in, in basically opening the mind and heart to vision. So having like multiple meanings and so much history to the point where it's even the favorite of the fairies, which makes me ask, are all fairies in a love affair? Yeah. Um, but you know, it has, it has a long history. Um, but what's really unique is it can be used in beekeeping to imitate honey, honeybee pheromones. So that, if you guys are beekeepers and you're having trouble getting the amount of bees, or if you're interested in trying to keep bees, which is on my 2024 list, then you can plant some of that to hopefully bring them in. I will also say you can put it toward your vegetable gardens to protect against pests as well. Um, it's also used um, as a disinfectant in, soap, in soaps and uh, perfumes as well. Um, all right, if you have an allergy to citronella though, this will not be your friend. As I told you, Thai curry paste, this is a traditional ingredient. Um, and then also, as it goes, like many of the other ones, in a honey, in broth, in marinade, in tea. But the one note is, you guys, lemongrass is aggressively fibrous, so be sure to blend or grate it if you're gonna be consuming it fully. Um, otherwise, throw it into a broth, a stock, a soup, and pull out the piece of lemongrass later. So just being aware that if you are gonna consume the whole thing, blending or grating it fully so that you don't get like fibrous pieces in your teeth is preferred. Um, yeah, that should take you all around your plate. That should take you all around my garden. But Liz has some more information about what she had left in her garden. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce you to chocolate mint. And that's what your chocolate bonbons were made with. It has a deep, rich, smooth flavor to it. Now I did add, once I had mixed it up in this recipe, I had dried it, it's gonna lose some of its flavor, it's gonna lose some of its aroma, but still crushed between your fingers and you touch it to your nose, you can smell that deep, it's a very smooth, it's not your tart chocolatey, it's just almost like hit you in the back of the throat type of smooth dark chocolate flavor. So if you want to punch it a little bit in your recipes, add a little bit of crushed peppermint to it, or um, you know, mint extract, 
if you want a little bit more, but in your garden, and I want to pass this around, um, this it is a very aggressive grower, so you might want to do container pots with it. Um, if you'll just drag your fingers across the top, good luck, <laughs> and take a whiff, you can smell the chocolate. It is amazing. So even if you don't use it in a recipe, and you want to use it on your patio, just out where you're, or in, on your tabletop, then put it in your arrangement so that you have that smell, that aroma, and it, it's such a wonderful conversation piece. Float it in a glass of water, in a gin and tonic, in a mojito, a chocolate mojito. There are lots of different ways that you can use a chocolate mint. Look at some of the folklore and legend about this. This just like, like Haley hit it on the bee balm and the lemongrass you're going to find some of the most delightful tales about these plants. And I have a book list a little bit. Rogers Public Library has a wonderful section of different kinds of folklore and languages of flowers um, that we'll share in a little bit. But it was thought to bring eternal happiness if you found it on Midsummer Eve. And, of course, that is June 24th. So everybody go out on June 24th and see if you can find a mint and carry it around, and you will have happiness, eternal happiness. Not just happiness, it's eternal happiness. Now, carrying a bouquet of mint with St. John's Ward was said to have protection, provide protection from wicked spirits and evil, evil spells. So I'm just imagining tea time conversations or luncheon conversations as you're sitting around and going, have some mint. <laughs> <laughs> there is a Greek myth of mint and Hades, which, as we all know, the Greek gods were kind of gadabouts. And if you're familiar with how Hades entrapped Persephone and dragged her down into the underworld as his queen, you'll know that she was not too favorable to the whole idea. But once she got down there, and there was no way out except for the three months that her mother had bargained to get her out, um, for spring and summer, she uh, kind of created a territory for herself, and she was not particularly happy with her husband's ramblings. <laughs> so he fell in love with, many times, besides Persephone, but one of the wood nymphs that he fell in love with was a beautiful wood nymph named Mint. And that's where we get the name of Mint, because... Persephone, in her jealous rage, <coughs> sapped mint and turned her into a plant. But Hades' heart was, was moved. And he thought, well, I can't undo what Persephone did, but I can make her the most beautiful and aromatic plant that there is. So, poof, magic, he turned her into the mint plant. So there's the love story behind mint. And I don't know, you always have chocolate with strawberries, and that's kind of a romantic thing. So, you know, you got a little story to go with it. Okay, so the aroma of chocolate, um, but it also has an orange citrus flavor, which is kind of neat in baking. You know, put it in brownies or in these bonbons, you're going to get just a little bit of citrusy flavor to that. It can grow about two feet tall, spreads quickly, so my advice is keep it in a container pot on your patio. Um, you can freeze it into ice cubes and add it in drinks. I have not tried that, but you can bet I'm going to. That sounds like fun. Just, you know, when you put it in just water, a mint in water, it just quenches your thirst so much faster than just down in a glass of water. So on a hot summer day, add a little sprig of mint, whether it's chocolate mint, spearmint, peppermint, Add a little, a little sprig of mint to your water, and it's so, so refreshing. Um, it's used to make teas. You can add it to coffee or hot chocolate. Think of that. Instead of stirring your hot chocolate with a peppermint stick, you can just put a little sprig of your, your chocolate mint on the corner of your hot chocolate, spice it up, and there you've got another sparking point conversation. You can use it as cocktail garnishes, milkshakes, ice cream, pastries, puddings, salads, and sauces for lamb or fish. And then, of course, it's like one of those uh, advertisements that you see on TV for the knife that does everything. It slices, it dices, it shampoos your rug, you know, all these things that a knife can do. It's kind of like chocolate mint does the same thing. You can use it for all of these things, and you can use it for a pesticide against mice, ants, and mosquitoes. 
So there's a there's a good point. Let's take a look. Oh, there's another use for men. I heard it. I can have one more thing. I grow it, and it's my very favorite of all. And I grab a handful of it and just go like this. Yeah. And then take the deepest breath, and it's like you went to heaven. Isn't oh it? It's, so it's just out. so satisfying. Yeah. It's like yeah, the aromas of plants can do that to you. Yes, in the back. So the leaves are so tiny. How much do you use in the application? Well, this I just dug up. It was buried underneath my leaves. So the leaves will get about as big as your thumbnail. So it's not as big as like a cat mint or a spearmint. It's a little bit smaller and rounder than that, but it is much bigger than the plant that we're passing around. So how much do you use for this recipe? And this I used about a fourth of a cup. So I used a bunch. But it was dried. Remember, if you're going to use it fresh, you probably want to use less. Okay. Use your mortar and pestle, chop it up. Yes, so Belly. I've, I've added um, cayenne to mine. Oh, cayenne. Oh, gosh, yeah. If you, ever want a, if you ever want a punch to whatever baking thing that you're doing, like, for me, pumpkin bread is just bland when I make it. It's just bland, and I'm going, why did I make pumpkin bread? It's just so bland. Add a little bit of cayenne pepper to your recipe, and then the recipe doesn't change, the flavor doesn't change, but your mouth changes all around it, and you're just going, wow, give me another piece. So try it. Try it. It's good. Glenn? Is a truck to be flower? Yes, it does flower. All your mints are going to flower, and they're going to have beautiful, beautiful attraction for pollinators. All kinds of pollinators would love it. Like a regular mint flower, it'll be white and on a column with lots of little... I don't know. I have not smelled them. That is a bland thing to do in the future. Okay, here we have elderberries. I grew up with elderberries. My mom harvested elderberries in Iowa along the Skunk River in Ames for years. It was what we did in the summertime. We'd all put our swimsuits on, we'd go down to the river, she'd spend the afternoon picking elderberries and we'd swim. But when we got back home, we would be stripping the berries off the little umbrellas. And you wanna make sure that your berries are ripe. They're gonna be a shiny red, deep red purple. And if they're kind of a dull color, they're either overripe or they're underripe. But if they've got that nice shine to them and they're glistening and you're fighting the birds off from them, you've got some ripe elderberries. Make sure when you strip those elderberries, just gently, gently, and they'll just roll off between your fingers. When you just snap that umbrella off the elderberry plant, which is so easy to do, you just boink, and gently drag your fingers across it. Make sure you do not get any stems. If you get stems or a lot of the little ends of the, um, the berries in your jelly, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to hurt you, but you don't want to stray very far from the bathroom. Okay. It's a good cleanser, and that's one of its medicinal purposes. Uh, don't worry about this. I'm like an expert at this after having been, you know, harvesting elderberries since I was probably about eight years old. Um, and you can eat them raw. Uh, we don't recommend a large amount because just like apples, the seed itself has cyanide in it. Now, we eat apples all the time, and we don't die from it, um, but I would probably not sit there with a great big giant bunch of elderberries and, you know, shove them in like popcorn. Though, I know people who do, and it doesn't bother them at all. <laughs> so my advice to you, just like... Um, Haley brought up at the beginning, anything that's new, just take a little bit, taste it, and see how your body reacts to it. Elderberry jelly is not going to hurt anybody. It is strained. It is cooked. It is taken away from the seeds. It is just the juice of the berry. You're safe as can be with elderberry jelly. Here's what we use elderberries for. We use them for wines, we use them for colds and flu symptoms, for healing burns, improving complexions, reducing swelling and inflammation, stimulates the production of urine and induces sweating. 
When you go out to like um, traditional medicines of teas, um, you're going to find all different kinds of elderflower teas and elderberry teas in um, on the stores in Walmart and Harps and any grocery store. It's a good, you're going to find it mixed with other teas for sore throats. It's just an excellent, excellent plant to have around and it's native. So that's a good, good thing to know. It looks like this. It's just like a little umbrella thing. How many of you have seen um, elderberries by the side of the road or along in your backyard? Good. Okay. And blooming, it looks like this. It makes a lovely backyard garden. Um, high back by your fence lines, and then stagger down to your beauty berry next, and then down to your mints and your anise. Accent it with your lemongrass on either side, and you've got a, a garden, a plethora of food right there in your backyard with beautiful different blooming season. Okay, we use it in juices, jams, chutneys, pies, wine, flowers. Used to make a sweet syrup or infused into tea. I have not used the flowers for anything. I've just used the berries. Yes? I grew up with elderberries too, and uh, the elder uh, the elderflower syrup. Uh, if you've ever got a bottle of white wine that's kind of disappointing, you just put a little tiny bit of the elderflower syrup in it, and it will jazz up your white wine, and you'll think it, you know you've got a fifty dollar bottle. Oh, great! <laughs> On my list of things to do this summer when they come in bloom. Okay, and here you see, this is in my kitchen. Um, uh, you can see the, the berries here, and then you'll see like a stem, stem, stem. Those I'll pick out before I boil them down. But when you first pick them, it'll look like this, and then this, and then you boil it down and get your juice. Okay, branches, and this absolutely fascinated me because I love the folk stories and the folklore around different plants. Branches tied to doorways ward off evil, and an elder cross placed on a grave that blooms shows that the soul of the deceased is at peace, and it protects against dark magic. Now, okay, when I read that, I thought, an elder cross? How do you make an elder cross? Because, you know, I had envisions of, uh, or visions of uh, Palm Sunday crosses, you know how you you bend the, the palms and then you wrap them around, you've got this little cross. So just two or three days ago, I went out to my elderberry bush and I thought, how do you bend? And so I cut off a bunch of the twigs and tried to bend, I've got news for you, they don't bend. They don't bend like your, um, you know, your palm fronds do. So I couldn't make that loopy thing to make it go across. So I made this, it looks kind of witchy and Halloween-y, I guess, doesn't it? Kind of like a druid sort of a thing, but I'm gonna pass that around. But there are different ways that you could, and then I use willow branches to tie them with. Willows are for headaches and for soothing the soul, and willow is good. So it's a nice blend of elder and willow here if you're into understanding the language of flowers from ancient medieval times. So I'm just gonna pass that around. Just ideas for decorations and conversation pieces things to do, and then you can tell a little story. Yes? I, I'm a very <coughs> year. I had a good harvest in the second year, but this year, I was oh. like, yeah, okay, okay, I thought, is there something I'm doing no. wrong? I put a little cage around her, too, and the cage only goes up six feet, and they'll pull through and, okay. Yeah, they're native, and as you notice, the deer love them, too. I'm a Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalist, as well as a Garden Club member. And one of the things that um, we discussed was how you keep deer out of elderberry bushes. And I told them, I said, you are not going to like my answer because there are a lot of purists in Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalists who only want native plants. I kind of like a blend of cultivars and natives, and I like showing people how they can all get mixed together in the gardens. And <clears throat> what has helped and they don't touch it. You don't touch my elderberries. And here is why. Right next to my elderberries, I have mandinas. Mandinas are supposed to be terrible, terrible for anybody's garden. It's supposed to kill birds. It's their berries and all that kind of stuff. You're not supposed to have mandinas. I have mandinas. I have never found a dead bird in my yard except for the ones that my cats drag in. 
Um, I have never seen any bird go to a Nandina bush. And I've lived there 22 years, and the Nandinas have been there for at least 15 of those 22. The birds don't touch them. The birds are smarter than what we give them credit for, I think. So since they're around the elderberries, the, the, in my opinion, um, the, the birds have just, that's a no-fly zone. You know, it's like, whoa, berries from over there? Uh-uh, not touching them. They don't touch my elderberries, and I leave the Nandinas around them. Now, are they male and female? Mm -hmm. got the elderberries? Yeah, because I got one from um, Perennials Plus, and it was the last one that they'd taken the, the thing. It was a gift to me, and they didn't say they didn't have any information on it. So it was elderberries. Yeah. So what I took from Baker's Creek, and the person who told me said one was well, I'll be totally honest with you. I do not know. I've never heard that, and I have. No, I've just there's an elderberry. Pick it up, plant it, and it, you know, there you go. So I don't know. Yeah, that would be a good thing to Google. There are lots of things that I don't know about plants. So when I don't, I just whip that phone out or get on my computer and go, "What's up with this?" And that's the best thing to do. The elderberry jelly will be the dark purpley red that you sample. Okay, so we talked a little bit about landscaping with edibles, and these are just a variety of pictures to show you the possibilities of mixing native with uh, cultivars and also using some of the plants that we talked about in your gardening. Now, the actual plants are not the exact same plants that we we're talking about, but you'll see. Um, here we have a blend of, of flowers and plants. You want to you want to plant for seasons of blooming. You want to plant for heights, and you want to plant for soil locations and um, drainage of your yard, as well as taking into consideration sun factors. So, um, if you're dealing with mints and herbs, I like the container potting because I like to go out from the patio, you know, from my kitchen directly to the patio and just pick what I need because some of your recipes will say fresh thyme or fresh basil. And then you can just go right there to your pot, your potted plants on your porch. You don't have to put your hip boots on and wade through the backyard to, uh, to get what you need. So this is just an idea. Lots of different types of pots staggered for heights along the steps. That's really cool, I think. Here you have a neat idea of a container garden built at your own with um, logs from maybe a tree after like the 2019 tornado went through. We could have had a lot of these kind of gar gardens. Um, this is our butterfly park down at the rail yard. So you see how we've incorporated native stones with the pathways and the different heights, the evergreens with a lot of the natives. So these are nodding onions in the front. Um, Blue night salvia over here, which is uh, in the family of sage. Um, over here, think about lavender. Think about the anise. Think about the hyssop. Um, you have uh, black-eyed Susans right here. Mixed in with grasses over here, think about your lemongrass growing here along walks of native stone that wind up and around the trees and yet still allow for open spaces with lots of sun. Here you can just envision um, different kinds of basil, your ornamental red basil. Um, you could do, um, let's see, there's your lemongrass in the back. You could do your hyssop right here. You could do bee balm right back there, staggering it up so that your different layers watch the heights of your plants. Here is a more formal look. When you go native, you don't have to go totally wild. It doesn't have to be like a prairie. It can be something like this. You just prune them back. You become the deer. <laughs> and, and you go, okay, I'm just going to have a little more artistic um, endeavor here for designing the shape of the plant that I want, uh, but I'm still using native plants. So you can come up with a more formal look to your garden that way too. So these are all these vegetables. You could even do like a nice little square English Coventry garden type of look with different squares, with a grass walkways in between or stepping stones. You don't have to have a, a raised bed just to have your separate garden spaces like they've shown here. So those are just some ideas.
So these were some of the books that I looked up that the Rogers Public Library has available for you, and they have many, many more on gardening design, container gardening, um, herbs and garden, wildflower gardening, tree books. There's a lot we can get from trees um, that, it, that are edible. Backyard berry books, guide to wild foods and useful plants, lore of the wild, if you're really into those crazy conversation starters. They're just intriguing to me. And then folklore and symbolism of flowers. They're all right here in the Rogers Public Library. So I hope you'll wander through their aisles and take a look through their computer inventory and see what in the world is available for you here. I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised. So in conclusion, we want you to remember that a luncheon can be much more than just a gathering to eat. It can include tales from the plants to spark conversations. It can bring the smells and the taste of your very own garden to your table. You can use the opportunity to design future gardenscapes with your friends. And if you come to GCR, we introduce all of this and more. So I'm going to turn the last slide over to Diana. At the back table, I would love for you to sign uh, a sheet to be invited to a Garden Club of Rogers meeting. We meet the first Tuesday of the month uh, at 1030. And there's an optional lunch. And <clears throat> we have different speakers on all sorts of topics to do with gardening, horticulture, and nature. And, <clears throat> and um, there's also another sign-up sheet next to my little um, sloth back there. If you're um, wanting a copy of the slideshow and the recipes that came with this, Put your name and your email address and we'll get those to you. It, let's give us a week, okay? That's my name and email. I'm the contact person for Garden Club of Rogers, or you can find that on, you go to our website, ilovegcr.com. Um, that's really it. We really appreciate you coming. It was nice to spend this time with you. And um, I know you learned a few things and we enjoyed the taste. Okay. <laughs>